today we are really pleased to have a pre-Thanksgiving treat. So Dr. Abraham's like our very own Thanksgiving meal and feast of cardiovascular goodness. So it's a real pleasure to welcome um, a friend and a colleague. So Dr. Abraham is the um, Division Chief of the Advanced Heart Failure Program over at Providence um, Heart Institute in Oregon. And he actually started that program and was instrumental in getting them up and running in the field of temp MCS, durable MCS, and most recently heart transplantation. Um, he is a graduate of the Hopkins School of Medicine and was chief over there. And his main, a lot of his interests are centered around mechanical circulatory support and also, you know, the holistic approach to heart failure care from ambulatory monitoring up to the very intensive care of patients in our unit. So he is an extremely skilled communicator and teacher, and we're really glad to have snagged him just before Thanksgiving to talk to us. So Dr. Abraham Jacob, thank you very much. We appreciate you being here, particularly today, and we look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great, great. thanks. So um, thank you for the kind invitation to speak to you all about uh, cardiogenic shock management. Uh, I wish that I could be there, uh, but today I am at home in my home office and hopefully there will not be too many interruptions from pets or kids, but apologies in advance if either of those happen. <clears throat> So these are my uh, relevant disclosures for today's talk. And probably the most important of these disclosures is that I'm a member of the Cardiogenic Shock Working Group, which is a multi-center uh, research consortium headed out of Tufts. Um, and you'll be seeing a lot of data related to the Shock Working Group in this talk. So objectives for today, I wanna cover just some of the challenges and some of the trends in the Cardiogenic Shock space and hopefully give you an appreciation for the difficulties in generating um, evidence for the management of shock. Uh, I wanna discuss best practices in shock management, both for acute MI and for ADHF, and then to review some of the hemodynamic effects of temporary support devices. But let's start with a case. Uh, given that it is the holidays, as you will come to appreciate, I thought this was an appropriate case. So it's a 38-year-old healthy man who lives on the Oregon coast, which is about an hour and a half away, who was in the Portland area because he was taking his sick cat to the vet. Uh, he was accompanied by his girlfriend, and as they were driving back, she was the driver, he was the passenger. He complained to her that he felt a little lightheaded and then suddenly syncoped and became unresponsive. Um, fortunately, he was literally a block from our hospital, and so she just turned into our emergency room parking lot. He regained consciousness and they walked into the emergency room uh, where he again promptly uh, lost consciousness in and out. And his initial electrocardiogram uh, is shown here. And hopefully you can appreciate that there are some hyperacute uh, T waves and early ST segment elevation in the precordial leads. Uh, he was taken emergently to the cath lab where he had a VF arrest. And then, um, you know, as a non-interventionalist, as an advanced heart failure cardiologist, uh, I was hoping to start my Friday a little bit early and was walking out of the hospital at 5 p.m. when I got a call to please come to the cath lab stat. And this was the scene when I walked in the room, one of my colleagues, interventionalist Rick Sohn, uh, had gotten access, there was active CPR, he had placed a, an Impella device and had started uh, to perform a coronary angiogram. So this was the initial uh, shot of the left-sided system. You can see that there's an occluded uh, LAD. Uh, note the timestamp, this is 6.10 p.m. And this is a shot you never wanna take as an interventionalist, uh, active CPR uh, during the angiography and during the intervention. But you can see that he was able to successfully wire uh, the LAD and the LAD diagonal. And by 7.30 p.m., we had restoration of TIMI-3 flow in both the LAD and the LAD diagonal. And at this point, you know, we all breathed a sigh of relief. The patient's rhythm was stable. The blood pressure was stable. The impella device was flowing well. Um, but thinking as a heart failure cardiologist and as a critical care aficionado, I asked for the team to do hemodynamics with the right heart cath and to get um, a blood gas. 
So the hemodynamics are shown here. You can see that the right atrial pressure was quite elevated at 17. The wedge pressure uh, in the setting of the impella device flowing at P6 was 32. And concerningly, uh, the patient was still quite acidotic uh, with a pH of six, less than 6.8, uh, largely driven by his high CO2, probably from the fact that he had um, probably suffered trauma uh, and pulmonary edema in the setting of acute MI and CPR. So at that point, there was a multidisciplinary discussion about what the next best step was. And, you know, I presented this case to a number of different audiences, and I think it would be reasonable uh, at this point to place the patient on VA ECMO. Um, but in our institution, and in this particular case, we actually opted to place the patient on the V ECMO, uh, reasoning that the impella was doing a great job of unloading uh, or would do a great job of unloading if the right side uh, could be uh, further supported uh, and if we could correct his acidosis. And so that's uh, what ensued. Uh, one of our surgeons inserted an Avalon catheter, which is a dual lumen IJ catheter, 27 French into the right IJ. And um, you can see here the uh, concluding uh, fluoroscopy images showing the Impella CP in place as well as a TEE probe. Um, we're also very aggressive at our center with uh, placement of and utilizing uh, CRRT, uh, both for management of volume as well as acidosis. So because he was on ECMO, we were able to connect a CRT device in circuit. So he ends up on CRT with VV ECMO and an Impella CP device. And remarkably, uh, it did not take him long uh, to improve uh, significantly. This is his Impella device at P2 just a short 72 hours later, um, and he was able to be decannulated from all his support, including CRT, and within about a week to 10 days, he was discharged home in stable condition. And that's all great, but the part that really makes this such a touching story to me is that that event took place in May of 2017, and he subsequently um, <laughs> sent this postcard uh, to me around the holidays, uh, and the the Coda to the story is that his then girlfriend ultimately proposed to him and they got married. And here you can see, I think it's the cat on the left um, named Apollo that uh, was the one who uh, helped precipitate this entire event. So this was a, a great story, uh, particularly around the holidays. Um, but it also introduces a number of important themes. Uh, one of them being that despite, um, you know, all of the advances in technology and in PCI technology and pharmacotherapy, cardiogenic shock remains highly lethal. So taken, and this is data that was just published uh, this year, just last month, uh, looking at uh, in-hospital mortality uh, from 17 high volume centers in the cardiogenic shock working group. And you can see even in high performing centers in 2022, about one in three patients who present in cardiogenic shock will die and if you have a STEMI as the cause of your um, cardiogenic shock, you have a, about a one in two and a half chance of dying. Now, it is true that if you have heart failure, your uh, risk of dying is, is a bit lower at one in four, uh, but this still remains one of the most deadly diseases that we as clinicians will treat. And it's also important to recognize that the risk does not go away. So this is data that came from the Inova group. Shashank Sinha just published this. Um, here they show that if you look at acute MI cardiogenic shock uh, in red, that indeed in the first month, the risk of death is higher with acute MI. But as you can see, out to closer to one year, uh, those curves begin to approximate one another such that there is no statistical difference in one-year mortality between the two major etiologies of cardiogenic shock. So I hope this serves as a, a humble, humbling reminder uh, about the importance of this disease state. And as clinicians, and frankly, even as our industry partners and as payers assess this field, uh, this is a very difficult space that we all operate in, not only because there are a bewildering array of potential technologies, but also due to the, the lack of strong evidence to guide uh, our decision making. There are very limited RCTs, even in some of the most fundamental therapies, including modes of ventilation, choice of vasopressors and inotropes, certainly for mechanical circulatory support. And there are no good randomized trials, no randomized trials at all, good or bad, uh, with regards to use of invasive hemodynamics, ACMO, ACPELA, and CRRT. So this is truly uh, a sort of wild, wild west uh, when it comes to uh, these more advanced types of therapies. 
So as we approach this field, let's just start with the basics. What is cardiogenic shock and how do we define it? Um, you know, shock is defined clinically in much the same way it was defined in clinical trials. And the trials uh, from which various shock definitions have been derived are shown here. Perhaps the most uh, fundamental one or the, 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 the first uh, was the shock trial, which looked at the role of revascularization in acute myocardial infarction. And in that trial, the preliminary definition was hypotension defined as the systolic blood pressure of less than 90 for 30 minutes or requiring some sort of um, inotrope or vasopressor uh, to maintain blood pressure. And you can see that essentially all of these definitions from these different AMI trials include some description of hypotension in red, hypoperfusion, end organ hypoperfusion, and then four of these five definitions include some identification of congestion, uh, oftentimes based on hemodynamics or clinical findings of pulmonary congestion. So these three elements, hypotension, hypoperfusion, and congestion are sort of the cardinal features of cardiogenic shock. Um, but as we'll come to see, whether or not these criteria apply equally well to a heart failure patient somewhat remains to be seen. And the field has decided to continue to use these definitions, but it's worth asking whether these definitions are fully relevant to the heart failure population. And in fact, I would go so far as to say, if you look at some of the definitions of what is advanced heart failure, there is considerable overlap between cardiogenic shock, when we think about it from the MI perspective, and advanced heart failure, which oftentimes is in an ambulatory patient. And I'm sure you've all seen that clinically. Um, the sky shock stages have taken the definitions of cardiogenic shock and now applied a staging system uh, to help us standardize language and to standardize approaches uh, to patients who present in cardiogenic shock. And, you know, I won't go through uh, all of the different stages, but suffice it to say, the shock stages also include elements of hypotension, hypoperfusion, and congestion in the definition. Um, and the reason that these stages are important is that as one goes from A to B to C to D to E, one increasingly moves from a hemodynamic disturbance to a hemometabolic disturbance, in which as you get into the later stages of shock, simply normalizing hemodynamics with the device or with the drug or with the combination is no longer sufficient to salvage your patient because now you've got not only end organ dysfunction, but acidosis, vasoplegia, all of which it's hard to recover from. And you no longer have to provide just hemodynamic support, but multi-organ support. And obviously with this comes a marked increase in, in hospital mortality. And part of the reason that's relevant in terms of considering evidence-based generation uh, is that when we look at the trials that have been performed in this space, uh, for some time, we were operating without any type of risk stratification. So one of the most oft-quoted studies in this space is the IMPRESS trial in severe shock, which compared 48 patients with acute myocardial infarction, randomized them to impella or intraaortic balloon pump. And as you can see at 30 days, which was the primary endpoint, there was no difference in mortality uh, between the two groups. Uh, and this is sort of the headline of the trial, but as you dig in deeper and look at who was enrolled, you can see that it's not surprising that there was no difference. 100% of the patients in the balloon pump arm received uh, CPR, 83% of patients in the impella arm. Uh, these patients all had very elevated lactates and severe acidosis, suggesting that these were stage E cardiogenic shock patients. And because there was no risk stratification, there were no protocols, there was no uh, hemodynamic profiling of these patients, it's not surprising that there was no difference. And so as we think about how to progress the field, the cardiogenic shock stages are a fundamental element in helping to define patients' populations who are at risk and defining which interventions are um, going to be effective in various populations. And that becomes important as you approach a patient at the bedside and you think about well, what stage is this patient who's in front of me at and where are they going? Because that can help you decide which therapies should be implemented or perhaps that patient is too far gone to benefit from any therapy. So returning uh, again to the acute MI population and up to the evidence basis, um, this is one trial you definitely need to know. 
uh, and I'm going to date myself, but when I was a fellow, this is a trial that we were talking about. This is the uh, landmark shock trial, again, that compared uh, patients who present with cardiogenic shock in the setting of MI who underwent immediate revascularization versus initial medical stabilization, oftentimes with the balloon pump, uh, with delayed PCI as indicated. And the first shock publication looked at outcomes at 30 days and was actually negative, uh, as shown on the left-hand uh, Kaplan-Meier curve. There was actually no difference in mortality at 30 days. But a subsequent publication uh, looked at survival curves at six and 12 months, and you can see that at six months, there was actually a statistically significant difference. And it's this trial, therefore, that provides the evidence basis uh, for this recommendation in the uh, cardiogenic shock uh, MI guidelines, which states, gives a uh, level of evidence B, class of recommendation one, that patients who present with STEMI and shock should undergo revascularization, uh, preferably with PCI. Um, but from that point onward, um, the strength of, of evidence and the amount of therapies that have been evidence-based and shown to be um, supported in the acute MI shock space are relatively limited. This is a nice uh, summary slide that looks at multiple interventions that have been studied in a randomized fashion in the acute MI space. And the bottom line is, what we know is that besides early revascularization, we should be performing PCI of the culprit lesion only, not of non-culprit lesions in the setting of shock. And that when it comes to vasopressors and inotropes, norepinephrine uh, has been shown to be superior to the combination or to, to dopamine or epinephrine individually or in combination. And that's really what we know when it comes to acute MI. Now, I'm not an interventionalist, so I really want to focus a lot of the time on heart failure. And part of the reason besides my own uh, intellectual bias is that heart failure is driving the rising prevalence of cardiogenic shock. Uh, these data from the National Inpatient Sample show that cardiogenic shock prevalence is increasing and it's being driven predominantly by non-acute MI, i.e. heart failure, cardiogenic shock. So it's important that we really think about uh, heart failure as a cause of, of shock and how it might be different. And if you pause to think about it, the pathophysiology of decompensated heart failure cardiogenic shock is significantly different from that of acute MI. So acute MI, you have a coronary acute occlusion. This leads to massive LV systolic and diastolic dysfunction, which leads to hypotension, then hypoperfusion, and that causes secondary pulmonary and end organ congestion. But this sequence is actually reversed in the vast majority of heart failure patients. We know that most patients with decompensated heart failure have elevation of, of filling pressures, i.e. a high left atrial pressure and a high right atrial pressure. And as they progress from heart failure into shock, this congestion ultimately leads to worsening organ, uh, worsening uh, cardiac output to hypoperfusion, and then ultimately to hypotension as they develop this inflammatory state. So the sequence of events actually becomes reversed. And that's you know, nicely demonstrated here. Dr. Robinson uh, talked about my interest, uh, our shared interest in uh, hemodynamic monitoring. So this is actually an interesting case that illustrates the point that I just made about the importance of congestion. This is a 44-year-old man with a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy who was referred to our group. And at the time that we met him in May of 2018, he was not uh, a great candidate for advanced therapies uh, due to substance use. So we implanted him uh, with a CardioMEMS device, um, for those who are not familiar with looking at these uh, graphs, these are the pulmonary artery pressures, PA systolic in red, PA diastolic in green, and PA mean pressure in blue. And these are trended over time. And when we met the patient, uh, we initially tried to optimize medical therapy. So he was started on Entresto and then the drug was increased. And you can see that for the first uh, two months or so, he actually responded well to that with a decline in his pulmonary artery pressures. But as his heart failure worsened, you see that he became more congested with a rise in his pulmonary artery pressures, ultimately uh, developing worsening renal insufficiency and then being hospitalized, shown here in the shaded pink uh, bar, uh, hospitalized and started on milrinone with the anticipation that he would be bridged on inotropes uh, to a VAD. Uh, but unfortunately, he didn't stay out of the hospital very long, got readmitted shortly after being started on milrinone. Hemodynamics were worsened. Uh, he was actually placed on a 
a temporary support device and bridged to a HeartMate 3 device. And you can see with mechanical circulatory support, a durable LVAD, his PA pressure is normalized. And I'm, I'm happy to say that actually just uh, about two months ago, he was transplanted. Uh, so this is a nice illustration of that longitudinal continuum of heart failure care that Dr. Robinson alluded to earlier and illustrating uh, the points about congestion. So what do we know from our guidelines about optimal management of heart failure cardiogenic shock? Uh, unfortunately, not a lot. I mean, these recommendations are really more common sense than anything, but they begin with um, patients with cardiogenic shock uh, due to heart failure should receive IV inotropic support to maintain systemic perfusion and end organ performance. That makes sense. Uh, temporary MCS is reasonable. Management by a multidisciplinary team is reasonable. Uh, and there are weak recommendations to use a PA catheter uh, and to uh, triage patients uh, to uh, centers that can provide temporary MCS. So as we get further down this list, uh, the strength of the recommendations is certainly weaker. Um, and so that's why I really wanna spend the remainder of the talk today sort of talking about these uh, various potential interventions and my perspective on them. So which inotropes should we be using in, in heart failure cardiogenic shock? Uh, you're likely uh, familiar with this recently published study that came from the New England Journal of Medicine, in which 192 patients with cardiogenic shock due to all etiologies were randomized in a double-blind fashion to receive either milrinone or dobutamine. Um, they had to meet a definition of cardiogenic shock that included a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 with end organ dysfunction. And for those who received um, hemodynamic monitoring, they had to have those hemodynamics. And the primary endpoint is shown here. It's a combination of mortality, uh, need for heart replacement therapy, stroke, and uh, renal replacement therapy. And as you may be aware, there was no difference in the primary endpoint between patients receiving milrinone or dibutamine. And I know, um, you know, when I, again, <laughs> hearkening back to when I was a fellow, there was a lot of belief um, that patients who have uh, heart failure in particular uh, may benefit more from milrinone due to the pulmonary uh, and, vaso and systemic vasodilatory effects of that drug. But this analysis and the forest plots that followed showed no uh, distinct benefit in that particular subpopulation. Uh, so I think this is an important study that basically tells us that we are um, reasonable to use either one of these, uh, but I can tell you that uh, these same authors are now conducting a randomized trial of milrinone or dibutamine against placebo to actually prove that either one of these drugs actually has any benefit uh, compared to a placebo. Um, so then the question becomes, well, let's say we put a patient on one of these drugs at what point should we think about something more invasive? Um, these are, are data uh, that actually came from an ECMO study uh, that basically uh, looked at predictors of poor outcomes on ECMO. Uh, and there are, are various studies that have looked at this question, but all of them come to the conclusion that once you've started a second drug or certainly a third drug, that's really when uh, the mortality uh, begins to rise for patients in cardiogenic shock. So a sort of rule of thumb is that if you're thinking about adding a second drug to your first inotrope, whether it's milrinone or dibutamine, you really ought to be thinking about whether that patient is a candidate uh, for mechanical circulatory support, recognizing that obviously those devices have their own sets of trade-offs, um, but if this patient is a candidate for more invasive therapy, that's really the time to think about it. And that's important because most of our patients who we encounter with cardiogenic shock will require escalation. Again, this comes from the cardiogenic shock working group, and this was a really interesting analysis in which we looked at the percentage of patients who require escalation over the trajectory of their hospitalization. And as you can see, whether you're an MI patient shown in this red color or a heart failure patient shown in the darker color, 91% of patients on average in the stage B population, so these are people who are not on any devices, um, maybe on a drip, are progressing uh, to, a, to a higher stage. So stage C, where they're in sort of a classic shock state. And of those, the majority are progressing to stage D. And again, these are patients in contemporary cohorts at high volume, uh, shock center. So that's really a, a striking finding that most of our patients are going to progress. 
And I think the other message that we should take home from this is that if we really wanted to make an impact on shock management and do so in a way that's the most efficient, uh, it's really to focus on these stage B patients. And remember, these are the patients who may have evidence of congestion, um, but are not uh, having uh, marked end organ dysfunction. And we alluded to this earlier, but the importance of preventing that progression uh, to later stages of shock. You can see that once you become a stage D patient, whether you're an MI or a heart failure patient, there is this marked nonlinear increase uh, in mortality. And that's where you go from sort of the 20% in hospital mortality to around 45, uh, 50% if you're an MI patient and around 30 to 45% if you're a heart failure patient. So early identification becomes really critical. So what, how do we better identify shock? And I, and I think um, particularly in the heart failure population, um, this becomes very important, is I think more aggressive and upfront use of hemodynamic profiling with the pulmonary artery catheter. These data, again, from the shock working group, uh, just looked at patients who received a PA catheter, uh, what were their outcomes? And in particular, they looked at patients who either didn't get a PA catheter had some hemodynamics measured as opposed to complete hemodynamic ass assessment, which included uh, measurement of filling pressures and cardiac output. And you can see, particularly for the patients who were in the later stages of shock, the more hemodynamic information was available uh, was associated with improved outcomes. So we can't say causation, but certainly knowledge of hemodynamics um, is associated with improved outcomes. And I would suggest to you, based on uh, my own practice, that this is a truly uh, important step. Uh, many of you have probably encountered patients, uh, again, especially those who have heart failure, in which the hemodynamics are shockingly worse than initially anticipated uh, based on physical exam and clinical assessment. Um, and it's not only important for diagnosing cardiogenic shock, but also for profiling which type of shock are we talking about, because patients can obviously have LV dominant shock, RV dominant shock or biventricular shock, which can help, again, guide uh, further management of the patient. And then it's important that all of you become familiar, if you're not already, uh, with these various hemodynamic metrics that can be calculated from the various parameters uh, that are uh, derived from the PA catheter. And these have not only diagnostic significance, but also prognostic significance as well uh, as guiding uh, treatment decisions, uh, particularly as it relates to identifying uh, right ventricular dysfunction, which, uh, as you all know, in any cardiovascular state, whether you're talking about pulmonary embolism, left heart failure, and definitely in the, in the shock space, the presence of RV dysfunction is another marker of high mortality. So very important that we identify it and treat it early. And just to go back to the point uh, made a minute ago about the limitations of physical exam, I really like uh, this paper, which was done at the University of Chicago by Nikhil Narang and colleagues, in which patients who were undergoing routine right heart cath were evaluated clinically by trainees and attendings, so interns all the way through attendings, and they were asked to classify uh, filling pressures and index. And the bottom line is that nobody was especially good at being able to predict hemodynamics based on physical exam. And in particular, the sickest patients, those who were wet and cold, those, those uh, respondents only had about a 50% negative predictive value. So if I say this patient's not in shock, you may as well flip a coin because chances are equally uh, possible that they, that they do have high filling pressures and are in a low output state. So, this, again, supports the fact that we need to be more aggressive, in my opinion, in utilizing pulmonary artery catheterization. So we've gone uh, through initial management with inotropes. Uh, we've talked about the importance of hemodynamic profiling. What about those patients who then were considering mechanical circulatory support? Um, there has been you know, tremendous engineering advances over the last decade, uh, and now we have devices that support uh, isolated uh, LV support, uh, isolated RV support, and biventricular support in the form of ECMO. And of course, we can combine these devices such as ECPELA. Uh, we can use um, Protect Duo with an Impella device. So we have all of these uh, different devices that can be used in isolation or in combination. Uh, 
And these are incredible uh, options that we have today that, again, not all of these existed when I was a fellow. And it's important to understand that each of these devices has distinct hemodynamic effects. So if we just take, for example, the balloon pump, which to this day remains the most commonly utilized uh, form of mechanical circulatory support, uh, it has a distinct effect on the pressure volume loop. So the main impact of the balloon pump is to reduce uh, peak left ventricular uh, systolic pressure and to bring about a marginal change in LV uh, and systolic volume. And in doing so, it changes and reduces uh, LV and arterial elastins. Um, but the overall effect on the pressure volume loop is, is not significant. Um, by contrast, VA ECMO produces a very significant uh, reduction in pressure, but does so at the expense of increasing uh, arterial pressure. So it actually increases the amount of work uh, and loads uh, the failing heart. And it's for that reason that there's a lot of interest in venting the left ventricle uh, with balloon pump, with impella, with um, atrial septostomy. But that's the hemodynamic foundation uh, for that uh, intervention. The tandem heart device uh, decreases volume significantly as well um, and shifts the pressure volume loop uh, downward and to uh, the left. And the impella device also has a marked uh, impact on both pressure and volume. And this is important, especially in the setting of acute MI, because the area encompassed by the pressure volume loop relates to the amount of energy consumption by the heart and the act of work being done by the heart. And in the setting of um, constrained myocardial uh, oxygen delivery, uh, reducing myocardial work uh, may be an important strategy moving forward uh, to improve acute MI outcomes. And as you may be aware, there's a lot of work being done uh, to reduce LV loading uh, prior to revascularization. Now, I think it's important when we look at different uh, devices to think about when we are thinking about using these devices clinically, what is our primary objective? Is it to increase systemic blood pressure? Is it to unload the left ventricle? Is it to improve coronary perfusion? Or are we dealing with a patient whose primary hemodynamic perturbation is high CVP, high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and we really want to unload um, the end organs, the renal and hepatic axis, if you will, uh, that may be uh, impaired uh, due to high venous pressures. And there are different hemodynamic metrics that we can monitor as surrogates or as markers of each of these objectives, and then there are various biomarkers. And as we think about that, um, then we can think about which interventions might be most appropriate for each of these goals. And obviously, we oftentimes are combining uh, multiple goals together, uh, but it helps to think in a structured way about which of these goals is most important because that can help decide which intervention is most appropriate for the patient in front of you. Um, you know, there are lots of tables that compare the different devices, and I, I don't want to go through this in much detail. This is mainly for reference. But I do want to highlight that, of course, the challenge on the mechanical circulatory support side is that as we get more powerful devices, we're usually also accruing a higher cannula size, a higher French size, which brings with it the risk of particularly of vascular complications such as ischemia or bleeding. And those vascular complications uh, have their own detrimental impact on survival. And there's really nothing uh, that is more disheartening than salvaging a patient from shock, but having them lose uh, an extremity because of arterial insufficiency. I, I want to spend a little bit more time uh, focusing on the balloon pump, since again, that is the most commonly used uh, device, uh, even uh, in 2022. Um, so, as you all know, the uh, balloon pump inflates in diastole and deflates in systole. And as I mentioned earlier, it reduces LV systolic pressure uh, and it increases stroke volume uh, somewhat. And by doing so, uh, impacts arterial elastins. And the impact of the device as an unloading tool, when we think about unloading, um, really has to do more with the reduction in peak systolic pressure that's achieved uh, between the unassisted state and the uh, assisted state. And when one looks at that metric, systolic unloading, uh, it turns out that the 50cc balloons uh, actually, and perhaps not surprisingly, bring about greater systolic unloading uh, than the conventional 40cc balloon. 
And as you can see, the black, the patient's shown with the black bars here, this shows the magnitude of systolic unloading and patients who achieved a 10 millimeter uh, difference in systolic unloading were defined in this particular uh, observational study as being responders. So you can see that there is heterogeneity in response to a balloon pump. And the larger the balloon pump you use, the greater likelihood of seeing a response. So even though we know uh, that in the randomized trial, uh, the IABP shock 2 study, which looked at patients who presented uh, with uh, cardiogenic shock due to acute MI, that there was no difference between medical therapy and the balloon pump. Uh, there is likely heterogeneity in that response. And this you know, was a study that did not specify uh, use of a 50 cc balloon. And so even though the balloon pump is largely thought to be dead, I still think it has a role, uh, especially in the heart failure population. And there have been studies that have tried to identify which patients with heart failure are most likely to respond uh, to insertion of a balloon pump. Uh, and this was a nice uh, study which summarizes some of that data. The bottom line is, in order for the balloon pump to be effective, there needs to be some cardiovascular, some LV reserve, because if your LV is so dysfunctional um, that it can't increase uh, stroke volume, then you're unlikely to benefit from the balloon pump. So the particular parameter that was identified in this study was a cardiac power index of greater than 0.33 watts per meter squared. You also have to have adequate RV function, so a PAPI greater than 2 and an RV cardiac power index of greater than 0.13. Um, because of the balloon pump's impact on afterload, having a high systemic vascular resistance is actually a marker of likelihood of responding, having a high left-sided filling pressure, and then having a heart rate that's not uh, especially high uh, given the dependence of the balloon pump on, on rhythm. Now contrast the balloon pump uh, with a transvalvular pump like the Impella. Uh, the impella device flow through that device uh, represented as H is essentially determined by the transvalvular pressure gradient, the pressure in the aorta minus the pressure in the left ventricle. So as the LV becomes more dysfunctional, your aortic pressure goes down and your LV pressure goes up, which leads to more flow provided by the impella device. So as the ventricle becomes more dysfunctional, you get more benefit from the continuous flow pump. And this is you know, the same principle at work in a durable LVAD, except that in that configuration, um, the pump is at the apex and the flow is to the aorta in that way rather than transvalvular. But the same concepts apply. Um, you know, these curves are called pressure uh, flow curves. And again, the higher the LV pressure and the lower the aortic pressure, the more flow that will go through the pump. VA ECMO um, is also increasing in utilization, uh, both globally and in the United States. Um, this uh, configuration provides both biventricular support and allows for oxygenation. As I alluded to, it does increase afterload on the LV as pressurized blood returned through the femoral artery uh, creates a pressure stream that counteracts anti-grade flow from the left ventricle, which can lead to distension and complications such as pulmonary edema or LV thrombus or aortic root thrombus. Um, it's really beyond the scope of this talk, though happy to discuss it in the um, Q&A, um, but you know, using a vent uh, is a common strategy to avoid that. But really we should be thinking about ECMO for those more critically ill patients in the later stages of cardiogenic shock uh, given um, you know, its invasiveness as well as the need uh, for uh, potentially uh, using a vent. Now, beyond the devices uh, and the negative trials that we've seen uh, in the space comparing um, you know, these more recent trials that have compared uh, balloon pump versus impella, what's really improved outcomes uh, in the contemporary era is not different pumps, but how we manage them and the use of hemodynamically driven algorithms uh, to improve outcomes. And the common theme amongst all of these different publications has really been a focus on early identification of shock, as we've already discussed, early use of hemodynamics to define the shock state and to guide therapy, earlier use of mechanical circulatory support, so not waiting for the later stages of shock, and then for patients who require it, earlier escalation from you know, potentially from, you know, one device to biventricular support or one device to a more powerful uh, device. 
And, and finally, and I like to show this slide again, dating myself, that the other common theme here is the use of multidisciplinary uh, teams because you know, as an advanced heart failure doctor, I bring a different perspective than say an interventional cardiologist or our heart failure, or, uh, or rather our surgical colleagues. But all of these perspectives are important. And given the complexity of the patients, it's very important that we have multiple perspectives represented uh, when we think about how best to treat these patients. Uh, I'll leave it to your imagination to figure out who's Michael Jordan uh, in this scenario. So kind of bringing it all together, um, this is a recent publication from Circulation um, that highlights uh, this sort of an expert uh, consensus opinion paper about approaches to shock management uh, due to both acute MI and heart failure cardiogenic shock. And I again, want to call out um, the, the recurring themes uh, in this paper that I've tried to highlight in this talk. The first is that they recommend placement of a PA catheter, so assessing hemodynamics to guide what happens next. After a device is placed in this case, um, they're recommending that we assess the response in the cath lab to that intervention. So if the patient's in shock, similar to the initial case that I presented, and you place a device, it's important that we assess in the cath lab, in the procedure space, the impact of that, rather than leaving the lab, going to the CICU, and realizing six hours later that this patient is still in shock, we should be making that determination and deciding about the need for additional support, right-sided support, more powerful pump right there in the lab and not waiting for the patient to deteriorate. And then, of course, assessing RV function through the combination of hemodynamics and echo imaging. Here's the pathway for heart failure cardiogenic shock. You'll notice that there's this uh, bifurcation where if the patient has adequate blood pressure, there is room for consideration of medical management up front, uh, including uh, vasodilators. So NIPRI would be a common example that we use if you see a high systemic vascular resistance and the patient has adequate blood pressure, giving uh, a vas pure vasodilator can often avoid the complications that come with both inotropes and MCS. But failing that, there is a role for balloon pump. And again, reassessing uh, the effect of the intervention. Uh, but if patients are refractory to those initial interventions, having a multidisciplinary consultation if it's available at one center, and then deciding upon potential uh, targets with mechanical circulatory support. I again want to emphasize that um, we're not just monitoring hemodynamics, but once we get back to the unit after we've gone through this protocol, it's also critically important that we monitor the effect on the hemo uh, metabolics. Uh, and in particular, lactate has emerged as a powerful uh, discriminatory marker uh, for helping identify patients who have not resolved their shock state. And it's probably not just the absolute initial value of the lactate that counts, but really how quickly the lactate washes out. So this was a study that looked at survivors and non-survivors of cardiogenic shock who had lactate measured at various time points. And you can really see that these curves start to separate, that if you haven't normalized or seen an improvement in your lactate by about eight to 12 hours, that really does um, predict one's longer term outcome. And so at our center, uh, and I would encourage you at your center to think about measuring the lactate at least every six hours to help um, determine again, uh, prognostically, whether your patient may benefit from uh, escalation sooner rather than later, as this will clearly uh, impact their longer term survival. And then finally, as part of the decision making that comes with uh, this field is the importance of having a standardized approach to escalation as well as weeding from mechanical circulatory support. Uh, oftentimes, this is done through a combination of hemodynamics, again, speaking to the importance of the Swan-Gans catheter, uh, but also with echo. Uh, and so usually there is a, a weaning of the device uh, with simultaneous echo and hemodynamics to ensure uh, that the patient is tolerating that and then further weaning um, support over time. And then clearly for those patients who fail uh, these weaning attempts, they should be considered earlier rather than later for durable LVAD or transplantation. And for centers uh, that don't have the ability to do that, I think it's really important that these patients uh, be discussed early on uh, with a advanced heart failure center so that patients uh, can get to the advanced heart failure center and go through the necessary evaluation 
uh, rather than wait until they've failed multiple weaning attempts. And I'm sure at your center, you've, you've had those transfers where patients have been at the referring hospital for, for days or weeks, and now you're trying to piece uh, things together, you know, one to two weeks in. I'm not going to focus um, too much on uh, surgically placed devices, but I will say at our center, we've uh, really taken to using uh, axillary inserted devices uh, because of the benefits of being able to ambulate patients. So at our center, we're very aggressive that if a patient who has a femorally placed device uh, is not able to wean, say, within 48 hours, and they're a candidate uh, for either additional therapies or we think that there's a good chance at recovery, uh, we will very quickly move to axillary access in order to uh, facilitate um, ambulation and progression uh, in the unit. Uh, and this can be done not only with, um, you know, in this case, an impella device on the right, but also with balloon pumps uh, where we anticipate longer duration of support. Uh, and this is critically important, uh, especially for patients who are undergoing um, bridging strategies, whether it's to VAD or to transplant, uh, but especially for transplant where the wait times are unpredictable, uh, it's really important that patients uh, be able to really, you know, maximize uh, their uh, ambulation to avoid frailty and the poor outcomes that come with that. Here's another patient who's actually ambulating with biventricular support. He's got a Protect Duo and a Tandem Heart on the right side and an Impella 5.5 on the left. And you don't have to stop in the hall. Here's a, a young patient who went out to our helipad outside the hospital. Um, he uh, was supported for over a month on, on his device while awaiting transplant. So just taking a, a quick peek uh, to what the future holds, I talked about the challenges of clinical trials in the shock space. These are some of the ongoing trials that are being done, including uh, DOREMI2, as I mentioned, where they're looking at dibutamine or milrinone compared to placebo in cardiogenic shock. And I won't go through all of these, but I do want to highlight um, that the cardiogenic shock working group, of which we're a part, is actually going to conduct a randomized trial within the working group comparing early use of a pulmonary artery catheter versus delayed. Uh, and the comparison here will be to any other metric of hemodynamic assessment, um, including placement of a central line and using uh, the CVP, ECHO, uh, lactate, other biomarkers. Um, but we want to see whether our belief in the PA catheter is truly justified. And as you can see, as you go down the list, there are a lot of trials, particularly in Europe, that are looking at uh, ECMO in combination with other therapies uh, to determine their impact in acute MI cardiogenic shock. So let's just uh, conclude by acknowledging that cardiogenic shock is a very complex space. Um, we as clinicians have to make a number of difficult and time-sensitive decisions at various time points. So, you know, there's the complexity of the initial shock diagnosis. There's the complexity of deciding whether to support a patient, how to support them. In the context of MI, there's all of the challenges around revascularizations and vascular safety that I uh, alluded to. But as the patient progresses in their trajectory, there are other decision points that have to be assessed. And for the patients who have heart failure, there's then, and, and as well as MI, but especially in the heart failure space, whether these patients need to go on to heart transplant or LVAD uh, versus being moved along a more palliative pathway. So this is the complexity of the trajectory that the patients go through. Um, and I think it's very challenging for all of us as clinicians, given the absence of evidence. But the best that we can do in the current state is to work together in a multidisciplinary care team, utilize algorithms, and utilize hemodynamics to help guide our decision making. And with that, I will stop presenting, and I am happy to take any questions and happy to uh, talk more about anything else. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks a lot, Jacob. Um, we love it. That was that was great. That was fantastic. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, but perhaps I'll take moderator's um, privilege and, and start first. So we recently discussed the ECMO CS trial that came out of you know Europe and was presented at AHA the other day. And they seem to preach um, a slightly different message to what you proposed where they thought there was equipoise between getting patients on ECMO up front and kind of having a more delayed wait and see strategy. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. We discussed it in our journal club and we came to some conclusions, but we welcome, you know, your, your impression. 
Yeah, you know, I think it really comes down to what each institution is comfortable with. It's partly a question of what are you good at, right? So if you're really good with ACMO, then I think there's, you know, that's an appropriate uh, strategy at that institution. Um, but, you know, ACMO has its downsides, uh, obviously. Um, but I think that it's a strategy that's worth considering if that's what you're comfortable with. Um, I think that um, I, I will say, again, based on experience, um, when we've had patients in whom we were considering ECMO, we will oftentimes either place ECMO up front and then use an impella as a vent and then try to quickly get them off the ECMO onto isolated LV support with the impella, and that's worked well. Um, but we also have had experiences where if the patient has a little bit of time and we can get them to a procedure space and put in, just say, go straight to axillary impella, even though the typical hemodynamic predictors of needing RV support are present, we've been able to support the patient with isolated, say, Impella 55 therapy and not needed RV support. So I think you know one of the challenges is all of the predictors of RV dysfunction have been based off of older device technology. And now that we have more powerful left-sided pumps, the question is open as to whether or not those predictors are still valid. And so I think that we um, we don't have a lot of clarity on that, and that's that's an issue for further study. And you know, there are next generation uh, axillary devices that uh, you know that are in the pipeline. So it'll be interesting to see how you know this continues to play out. I'm curious what you guys concluded then about. Uh, so so yes. we thought it was an interesting trial, and it was prospective, and that was wonderful. But the bulk of the patients were, you know, older men who'd had MIM. We weren't sure it was easily generalizable to the patient that we that we typically see. So we were going to wait and see what the other ECMO trials kind of, you know, kind of presented out um, um, in the coming months. So we've got um, a mixed audience here. Dr. Aurora, who's one of our CT intensivists and CT surgeons, um, is on the call. But Aurora, did you want to ask your question? Um, Working. Yeah, so thank you. first of all, thank you for an excellent talk. I got the invitation from our uh, head of our SICU, Jeremy Hoban. I'm a new guy here from Canada, so I'm learning uh, how you guys do shock differently down here than perhaps we do in Canada. Um, so very, really, really excellent talk, first of all. The first question I have for you is really regarding the Doremi trial. And at least in the post-VAD patient with biventricular dysfunction, where I was before, where we did not have ready access to Protec or uh, an RP Impella, that we often chemically arv out of these people with a bit of a mixture of both melanone and dibutamine. And sometimes two plus two equals five when you have that sort of chemical soup. And I wonder, as I go through do, do a 2 whether either or is the right, or maybe both versus placebo would be a, a reasonable choice. Because it's often more about the sauce you create rather than the individual ingredients sometimes with the two different uh, um, uh, agents. So I was curious about your thoughts and practice, uh, how you use it you know, in clinical space right now. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, um, and particularly in the post-operative patients, I mean, I think, you know, we all use these drugs uh, in combination. We use, you know, I think particularly for the RV, given the, you know, we, we have access, obviously, to the right-sided devices, but they all bring, they all have their costs. And so, particularly if a patient already has a left-sided device in, we are more likely to use a combination of inotropes to support the RV rather than proceeding directly to um, an RVAD. So I definitely think you're right. Um, particularly in that population, I think using hemodynamic principles and pharmaco pharmacologic principles, it makes total sense to do that and avoid, you know, now you've got double cannulation, you've got, you know, the risks of double anticoagulation. Um, so I, particularly if you're bridging somebody to say transplant, taking that right IJ and putting a large French device in there, you know, you got to do your biopsies down the road. Those are all considerations and we definitely don't rush into uh, our VADs uh, lightly. Oh, well, thank you. I think it really is in a situation where you've got, you know, really high filling pressures, you've got hepatic dysfunction and renal dysfunction that you think is on the basis of venous congestion and you really want to bring down uh, the CVP quickly. Or yeah. you're seeing that the LVAD is not flowing because of the RV failure despite inotropes. So those are yeah. really, I think, in our minds, the threshold at which we would proceed with an RVAD. Yeah, I think the, the other point from your talk that I think I agree that really highlights the need to think about venous hypertension and congestion 
on the on the the upstream, I guess, organs from the, from those that are really important, and then pivots a little bit to my second question about the use of the PA swan or the PA catheter. As you know, I'll date myself as well. Back in '99, when the trials came out and the initial use of a PA cast in critical care found it to be actually to be of harm, as well as some of the initial heart failure trials back at that time, and how we've done a bit of a sea change on that in the more recent trials with a whole generation of people who've never really used swans as part of their training or practice. So when you look at that trial in particular, you're really talking about the, the really experienced heart failure specialist versus not, and really about your thoughts about real implementation or real world implementation of that data in the UCPA CAS outside of a quaternary level center. Yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a great point. I mean, there needs to be a wholesale re-education of trainees and, you know, practicing cardiologists, critical care doctors about hemodynamic management. I mean, you know, we see this not even in outside of the ICU with cardiomems, for example. I mean, we give providers one hemodynamic metric, the PA pressures, and there's uncertainty about what to do with it. And now you complicate that picture with all of these other hemodynamic formulas. And I think part of it is there needs to be trials and shock working group is trying to answer some of these about which metrics are most important to normalize and how do we does, does how you normalize them matter um, we're actually writing a paper looking at different you know markers of congestion different markers of perfusion and seeing how that impacts prognosis we know that in general congestion markers are more prognostic than perfusion markers in chronic heart failure uh, and in shock um, but whether improving those actually changes outcomes remains to be seen. So I think, you know, to your point, there's a lot of uncertainty about how to do it and does it matter uh, at the end of the day. But I think in the meantime, we're, we're working off the presumption that, you know, based on physiologic principles that these things do matter and we need to treat them. But certainly we know that renal dysfunction and hepatic dysfunction are more tightly correlated with the CVP and right atrial pressure than, than cardiac index. Right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Romani's got a question for you. One of our heart failure cardiologists, clinical chief, Robbie. Thank you, Monique. Great talk, Dr. Abraham. I uh, really learned a lot. Uh, you know, like most places, we have issues with uh, CS, you know, the vascular issues, but also hemolysis and all that. I was just wondering if you have protocols in place to sort of minimize this from happening. Um, you know, beyond the usual stuff of minimizing the P level and, you know, do you take it out in a certain time of, of, uh, after you put it in? Do you have changeable protocols? What do you do for to minimize that? Yeah, so uh, first, just starting with um, screening. So, you know, patients who are getting an Impella device will get a daily uh, LDH and plasma-free hemoglobin. As you guys are all aware, the LDH is a nonspecific biomarker, so an elevated LDH in and of itself is not constitute hemolysis unless you're having, you know, you know, dark urine and hemoglobinuria. Um, we do echo frequently. So if the patient, you know, index hospitalization, index uh, implant, when they go from the cath lab to the unit, we will image those patients in the unit um, because, you know, the most common cause of hemolysis with the Impella CB, as you know, is malposition. And so, they're very position sensitive. And so we tend to be very aggressive in rechecking position. Uh, and if we're having hemolysis, we will try to reposition. In those cases where repositioning does not alleviate the hemolysis, we will often take out the CP and place an axillary device uh, that we found that the 5.5 uh, is much uh, less likely to cause hemolysis than the, than the CP and is much more stable. Uh, so all of those pictures of people who are ambulating with the device have a 5.5, and that's a, a much more stable long-term approach. Thank you. Thanks. And we, I know we're running up against 1 o'clock, but we did have another question. Dr. Montgomery, do you want to post your question directly? Sure. Thank, thanks so much, Dr. Abraham. Um, I'm just curious, like, when uh, you're approaching sort of enrollment for the PAX trial, are there patients you're just not going to enroll or I mean like or are you going to try and sort of say this is a uniform thing that we're going to take every single CS patient even that you know 30 year old guy that showed up in the you know ED with the VF you know arrest you know he's going to be someone that we sort of are going to enroll in this trial 
Yeah, I mean, I think this really uh, tests one's commitment to science, right? I mean, if we don't have equipoise, um, which, you know, I, I will tell you, I, I think some of my partners will not. And there are times when I don't think I will have equipoise either. So we actually haven't at our center uh, committed to doing the trial for various reasons. But I think the potential lack of equipoise amongst the heart failure cardiologists is a real challenge. And I know if you talk to Naveen Kapoor, that's a challenge at a lot of sites that, you know, we as a heart failure community have decided already in the absence of randomized data that this is a necessary part of our daily practice. So it is definitely challenging. Uh, again, you know, it's not PACS or PA catheter against nothing. It's against whatever other marker you want to use. Uh, but I do think that is going to be a difficult trial to enroll in. And honestly, you know, if, if that trial can enroll, I think that tells us something. Uh, or if we find that there is no difference between the two, that also tells us something. Um, but it is definitely a challenging trial, I think, to conduct given the belief that a lot of us have that the PA catheter is important and necessary. Great, thank you. Well, I, I, I think we're going to have to uh, draw a line under it there, but that was an amazing talk, Jacob. Thank you very much for joining us on the day before Thanksgiving. We appreciate you doubly, doubly for that. A lot of food for thought. Um, thanks for sharing your expertise, and um, we, we leave Richard for the experience. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving, guys. Take good care. All right, bye-bye.